than on the sands with printless foot. Do chase the ebbing Neptune, and do fly him when he comes back. You demi-puppets, that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make. With your aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun, called forth mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azure vault set roaring war. Whoa! With rattling thunder have I given fire, and rifted Jove stout oak with his own bolt. The strong base promontory have I made shake, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers oped, and let them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic I hear of Jure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring the airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet. King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me! Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, cursed in death, have burst from their cerements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly and earned hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean? Say, why is this? Wherefore, what should we do? It beckons you to go away with it. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You must not go with it, my, my lord. My fate cries out still, am I called? Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say away! Go on, I'll follow thee. Antipholus! Welcome home! to the quick, shouldst thou but hear that I were licentious, <laughs> and that this body, consecrate to thee by ruffian lust, should be content. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldst thou not spit at me, and spurn at me, and hurl the name of husband in my face, and tear the stained skin off my harlot brow, and from my false hand cut the wedding ring, and break it with a deep divorcing vow? Oh, I know thou canst, therefore see thou do it. I am possessed with an adulterate blot. Uh. My blood is mingled with the crime of lust. Oh. For if we two be one, and thou play false, I do digest the poison of thy flesh. Being strumpeted by thy contagion, Keep then, fair league, and truce with thy true bed. I live unstained, thou undishonored. This can be no.
no trick. Mm. Their conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she would rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. <laughs> I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say, the lady is fair. Tis the truth. I can bear them witness. <laughs> and virtuous. Tis so. I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. <laughs> By my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will become horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me, for I have railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? <laughs> A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No! <laughs> the world must be peopled! Uh, when I said I should die a bachelor, I didn't ever think I should live till I were married. <laughs> Prince How! <laughs> I know you all, and will the while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness, yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at, by breaking through the foul, ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work, and when they seldom come, they wish for come. And nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So when this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I never promised, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes. And like bright metal on sullen ground, my reformation glittering o'er my fault shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend to make offense a skill Redeeming time when men least think I will. Sigh no more, lady, sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. One foot in sea and one on shore. One thing on ever. Oldness comes to me now. It brings me heart. Prince Troilus, I have loved you night and day for many weary months. Why was my Cressida then so hard to win? Hard to seem one. But I was one, my lord, with the first glance that ever... <laughs> Pardon me. If I confess much, you will play the tyrant. I love you now, but not till now so much, but I might master it. In faith, I lie. My thoughts were like unbridled children grown too headstrong for their mother. See, we fools, why have I blabbed? Should be true to us when we are so unsecret to ourselves. But though I loved you well, I wooed you not, and yet Good faith, I, I wish myself a man, or that we women had meant privilege of speaking first. Sweet, bid me hold my tongue, for in this rapture I shall surely speak the thing I shall repent. See, see, your silence, cunning and dumbness, for my weakness draws my very soul of counsel. Stop my mouth. Helena, 
Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep forward, Lysander. We must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow, deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius, dote on you. <laughs> <laughs> How happy some over other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what's all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, thinks base and vile, holding no quantity. Love can transpose to form and dignity, and therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Juliet! <laughs> Juliet! <laughs> oh, where is that girl? What's what? What light do yonder window break? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair son, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou her maid art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal liver is but sick and green, and none but fools to wear it. Cast it off. Oh, it is my lady. It is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. <laughs> I am too bold. It is not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres to their return. What if her eyes were there? They in her head. The brightness of her cheeks would shame those stars, as daylight doth a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through an airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and they'd think that it were not night. See how her cheek leans upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I may touch that cheek. Hi, me. She speaks. Oh, speak again, Brady! <laughs> oh. <laughs> By whose direction found'st thou out this place? By love, that first did prompt me to inquire. He lent me counsel, and I lent him eyes. I am no pilot. Wert thou as far as that vast shore washed with the farthest sea, I should adventure for such merchandise. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. Else would have made him blush, but paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Uh, fain would I dwell in form. Fain, fain deny what I have spoke. Uh, but farewell compliment. Dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. But if thou swearest, Thou mayest prove false. At lovers' perjuries, they say Jove laughs. Gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou thinkest I am too easily won, I shall frown and be perverse and tell thee nay, so thou wilt woo. But else, not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond. And therefore thou mayest think my behavior light. But trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those who have more cunning to be strange. I should have been more strange, I must confess. But that thou ever hurts, ere I was where, my true love, passion, therefore pardon me, and not impute this yielding to light love, which the dark night hath so discovered. And sigh not so, but let them go. And Bonnie, 
Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. Aye, but I know. What dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. In faith, they are as true of heart as we. My father had a daughter, loved a man, as it might be, perhaps, were I a woman, I should your lordship. And what's her history? <clears throat> a blank, my lord. She never told her love, but let concealment, let, like a worm in the bud, feed on her damask cheek. She pined in thought with a green and yellow melancholy. She sat like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. Was not this love indeed? <clears throat> we men may say more, swear more, but indeed our shows are more than will. For still we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. All hail Duncan, King of Scotland. All hail Duncan, King of Scotland! 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 If we should fail, we fail? But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him? His two chamberlains will lie with wine and wassail so convinced that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep, their drenched natures lie as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon this unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers? Who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? I'm settled and bend up, each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away, and mock the time with fair show. False heart must hide what false face doth know. their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you that Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. <coughs> he was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? But Brutus
Brutus says, he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And I must pause till it come back to me. Sigh no more, lady, sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. One foot in sea and one on shore. I believe this tale would win my daughter, too. Good Brabantio, take up this mangled matter at best. Men do their broken weapons rather use in their bare hands. I pray you, hear her speak. If she confess that she was half the wooer, destruction on my head, if my bad blame light to the man. Come hither, gentle mistress. Do you perceive in all this noble company where most you owe obedience? My noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. To you, I am bound for life and education. My life and education both do learn me how to respect you. You are the Lord of duty. I am hitherto your daughter, but he is my husband. And so much duty as my mother showed to you, preferring you before her father, so much I challenge that I may profess due to the more, my Lord. Most gracious Duke, to my enfolding, lend your prosperous ear, and let me find a charter in your voice. This is my simpleness. I saw a fellow's visage in his mind, and to his honor and valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. So that, dear lords, if I be left behind, a moth of peace, and he go to the war, the rights for which I love him are bereft me. And I, a heavy interim, shall support by his dear absence. Let me go with him. Even as one heat, another heat expels. Or a nail, by strength, is driven out by another. The remembrance of a former love by newer object quite forgotten. <laughs> is it mine or Valentine's praise? Her true perfection of my false transgressions that leaves me reasonless to reason thus? She is fair. So is Julia that I love. And that I did love. For now my love is thawed. Like a waxen image gainst a fire, bears no impression of thing it was. Methinks my zeal to Valentine is cold. And that I love him not as I was won't. Oh, but I love his lady too, too much. And that's the reason I love him so little. Tis but a picture I've yet beheld that hath dazzled my reason's light. But when I look on her perfections, there is no reason but I should be blind. Oh, if I can check my erring love, I will. If not, to compass her, I'll use my skill. Phoebe! Mm. Phoebe! I would not be thy executioner! I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me I murder in mine eye, which is pretty sure, and very probable that eyes which are the frailest, softest things that shut their coward gates on autonomy shall be called foot tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. I'm trying to fix this one on. Why now, full town? Or if thou canst not, no, oh, for shame. For shame. <laughs> Why not to say mine eyes are murderers? Show me the wound mine eye hath left in thee. I scratch thee but with a pen, and there remain some scar of it. But now my eyes, which started at thee, hurt thee not. Nor I am sure there is not force in eyes that could do hurt. Baby! Baby! <laughs> Pray thee, 
tarry, pause a day or two, for in choosing wrong, I lose your company. So forbear a while. So something tells me, if not love, I would not lose you. And you know yourself. But at least you not understand me well. A maiden hath no tongue but only thought. I would detain thee for a month or two. I could teach you how to choose right. For I would be forsworn, which I will never be. So may you miss me. But if you do, you will make me wish a sin that I had been forsworn. Be sure these eyes, they overlook me and divide me. One half of me is yours and the other half yours. Not I know, but if I say mine, then yours. So all yours. Forbear a while. I speak too long. Tis peace the time to draw it out and eke it out in length. To stay the election. Sigh no more, lady, sigh no more. I am a man ever. One foot on sea. I politically, politically, thus have I politically begun my reign, and tis my hope to end successfully. My falcon now is sharp and passing empty, and till she stoop, she must not be full gorged, for then she never looks upon her lure. <laughs> Another way I must man my haggard is to make her come and know her keeper's call. That is, to watch her as we watch these kites that, that bait and beat but will not be obedient. She eat no meat today, nor none shall eat. Last night she slept not, nor tonight she shall not. As with the meat some undeserved fault I'll find about the making of the bed. And here I'll fling the pillows, there the sheets. This way the coverlet, and in another way the bolster. Aye, and amid this hurly, I intend that all is done in reverend care of her. <laughs> and in conclusion, she shall watch all night. And if she chance, Nod, I'll rail, and I'll brawl, and in the clamor, keep her still awake. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness, <laughs> and thus I'll curb her mad and headstrong humor. He who know better how to tame a shrew, speak now, it tis charity to show. But I do think it is their husband's fault if wives do fall. <sighs> Why, we have galls, and though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. But husbands know, their wives have sense like them. They see and smell, and have their palates for both sweet and sour, as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us out for others? Is it sport? I think it is. Doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Is frailty that thus airs? It is so too. And have we not the same affections, desires for sport, and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do, their ills, and show us so. Sigh no more, lady, sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. <laughs> One foot in sea. And one on shore, to one thing constant, never. Now, at the latest minutes of the hour, grant us thy loves. A time methinks too short to make a world without end bargain in. No, no, my lord, your grace is perjured much, full of dear guiltiness, and therefore this. If for my love, as 
there is no such cause, you will do aught. This shall you do for me. Your oath I will not trust, but go with speed to some forlorn and naked hermitage, remote from all the pleasures of the world. There stay until the twelve celestial signs have brought about the annual reckoning. If this austere, insociable life change not the offer made in heat of blood, if frosts and fasts, hard lodging and thin weeds nip not the gaudy blossoms of your love, but that it bear this trial and last love, then at the expiration of the year, come challenge me. Challenge me by these desserts, and by this virgin palm, now kissing thine, I will be thine. Until that instant, shut my woeful self up in a morning house, raining the tears of lamentation for the remembrance of my father's death. If this thou do deny, let our hands part, neither entitled in the other's heart. If this or more than this, I would deny, to flatter up these powers of mine with rest. The sudden hand of death close up mine eye, hence ever then my heart is in thy breast. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe to hell. It, it's over. <laughs>